Okay, number five. In the case of Bernie Madoff, the leading cause of operational losses were A, internal fraud, B, external fraud, C, damage to physical assets, D, bis business disruption and system failures. Well, A is obviously right. B, we talked about that. There may have been some um, external fraud going on, but it wasn't the leading cause of the operations losses. Neither was damage to physical assets or business disruption and system failures. So the best answer there, the leading answer, the leading cause would be A, internal fraud. Any questions or anybody want to dispute that? Feel free. Okay. Now you all got the answer right, so I don't know why you would. Uh, number six, sales practices at Wells Fargo were A, very successful. Both clients and Wells Fargo were very happy. No. B, resulted in a lot of external fraud. Well, I don't see that the case, you know, that being the case, it was a lot of internal fraud. C, ruined Wells Fargo's reputation and resulted in huge restitution and legal expenses. That's it, answer C. And it goes on. Um, they have a, a asset cap at Wells Fargo that they can only make so many loans uh, because they're still sort of in the penalty box. They're being reviewed by the regulators. And the ceiling on the amount of assets and loans that they can have has been uh, extended, I guess would be the right word for it. So, you know, if you're, if you're thinking, if you have a couple of bucks and you're thinking of investing in stock, and you're thinking of investing in Wells Fargo, I would discourage it. Not only do they have the problems that we read about, but they also have the problems that they can't even do that much more business. So sell it short. Uh, question seven, Robin Hood's operations and technology risk management, A, has excellent operations and risk technology risk management processes. B, was inadequate for Robinhood's rapid growth. C, is focused on internal fraud. B. B, it was the, it was the rapid growth. Uh, Robinhood was the first to give uh, free trading, no fee trading. And at that time, Charles Schwab, Ameritrade, everybody else was charging per trade. So Robin Hood got a lot of customers that way. And also just because of the look and feel of it, it looks like a video game more than anything else. And they piled on a lot of first time investors. And they did that without adequate systems. They had really never stress tested their systems for what they got. So B is the right answer. Inadequate uh, was inadequate for Robin Hood's rapid growth. Eight. Of the, now this, this is a, a kind of, more tricky one, but almost everybody got it right, number eight. Of the three lines of defense, which one is part of the business unit that owns and manages the business unit risk? Okay, an example of a business unit would be the student loan unit. Okay, so of the three lines of defense, which one is part of the business unit? Is it the first line of defense, the second line of defense, or the third line of defense? What's the business unit? First line. That's the first, first line. line of defense. First line of defense. And then you have the corporate risk people and then you have the corporate auditors. So the first line of defense are the folks in the business. Okay, credit protector. Uh, had large operation losses on the income statement primarily because A, the claim costs were too high Unemployed people were able to skip monthly payments during a period of high unemployment. Well, that's, that's what we were going for, is to, is to have you know, protection for people in periods of high unemployment. So that wasn't the downfall. 
B, large sum of money was large sums of money was spent on notifying enrolled customers when phone and internet lines were down and mail was undeliverable because roads were flooded, wasting money. Operations loss? Yes. 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 There, okay. Um, and the last one that we're gonna go over is, yet yeah, is 10. Operation losses include foregone revenue if a business unit is set, shut down for inadequate risk management. No. Okay, let's go to number one, which a lot of people got wrong. I think most people got it wrong. So I'm gonna accept this as uh, a bad question and give everybody credit for it. Now, credit for giving the right answer because there's only like two of you that got it right. A student loan marketing department launches a new product offered exclusively to medical school students. The only requirement for loan approval is enrollment in medical school. <clears throat> so there's, there's not a lot that they're asking for to get these loans approved. Just have to be uh, in medical school. Doesn't, doesn't matter what your credit history was, just be in medical school. The, the, this decision to limit the credit approval requirements was made by <clears throat> the credit policy department to maximize the demand for loans. Upon graduation, due to the limited requirements for approval, a large number of the graduates were unable to pay back the loans. Loan write-off expenses were much higher than anticipated. A, this is an operations loss and representatives from multiple areas, for example, legal finance, technology and credit policy should organize a team to address the high write-offs, okay? Uh, a lot of people said this and it wasn't right. We'll get back to it. B, this is an operations loss and the team to address the losses should be confined to the marketing team that launched the product in order to fix the problem and avoid uh, using resources that are not needed. No, the right answer is this is not an operations loss. The risk of higher write-off expenses was deliberately taken by the business to increase loan demand. Now, I, th I think where it got a little confusing is that I said a week ago that you, most, um, in most cases where there's something that looks like a big ops loss, but it was really caused by what they did in the front office, then it's not an ops loss. It's, you have your front office and your back office. Your front office is usually marketing, credit policy, uh, finance, those kind of groups. The back office is operations, okay? Maybe if I had used that expression front office and back office, it would have been more clear. Mm -hmm. And after all, I didn't give anybody an org chart to where you, know, you, you can see where the credit policy group is. So I could see how it was easy to make that mistake. Yeah, it came directly from credit policy because they wanted more loans. So they made the approval process uh, really slim down and uh, brief just to get as many loans. It wasn't that the back office operations people messed anything up. So the real answer was C, but since virtually everybody got that wrong, then it really means I got it wrong. It wasn't a good, good quiz or it wasn't a good uh, question. So everybody got it right. Okay. So there were a lot of people that got perfect scores, a lot of people. Uh, Professor? Yes. Can I ask you a quick question about that question? Which question? Um, about question number one. Okay. So I was going back and forth between uh, A and the question that was actually right. Um, wasn't, it, wasn't that very similar to what happened at City? And then you guys and you guys did classify it as an operational loss. Well, that the difference there was it was the operations department 
that wanted the shorter uh, application. And we were talking about the oh. students, right? It, oh, it, so it wasn't the it wasn't the credit policy department that made the decision at, at State. Yeah, it was the back office. And and just just in case this happens to come up on the final again, and we may have the very same question <laughs> on the final, <laughs> except I'll break out that uh, it's a, a front office group credit policy. Now I, I think you sort of get it. It's it's a little bit subjective and it, you may think it's form over substance, how we classify these, but it's really not. If, if it's an ops loss, you have the right people to look at it. You know, you have the operations people uh, and you get people from different disciplines, marketing, credit policy, finance to be part of the team, but the analysis and mitigation going forward of that operations loss um comes from the operations team when we classify it that that way so as the cfo i had people coming to me all the time saying let's call this an operations loss and i would say to them it, it's really not and there's there's a little degree of subjectivity there but it's not just form over substance the substance is if it's an ops loss problem you get different people from the organization working on it. Does that make so, sense? Yeah, so if I could just summarize really quickly, if it's the operations team that, that wants that clause in there, then it's an ops loss. If it's the credit people that want it there, then it's not an ops loss. Nope, if, if it's of the credit people, if they decide that the problem came from operations because they didn't ask for a cosigner, and you know the the operation and the credit policy team wanted a cosigner. Then the credit policy team would say these losses aren't ours. Right. Right. So, it, it, in a, a simple way to put it, I think is that nobody wants the expense to be theirs. <laughs> so, if you, if you're the credit policy person and things blow up, you look for somebody to blame. And right. in that example, it was the operations team because they weren't asking for a cosigner. And uh, the choice was deliberate. Got it. And, and, yeah. And, and right. Thank you. All right. Um, I haven't decided yet whether the final will be all multiple choice or multiple choice in an essay. What do people prefer? No essay. If you had multiple your choice. choice. You multiple choice. choice. You give partial credit for the essay. Multiple choice. And, and what if the essay was small, like a paragraph? I would personally take half of my time to write it because I'm not a good writer. <laughs> Like I, I'm at an advantage because, well, I only speak English, but like as a native English speaker, obviously it's like easier for me. So I like it, but I see where it could be difficult. But I do think it like tests in like a different way because I think like a skill that's kind of important is being able to actually like explain things in your own words. That being said, it's easier for someone who the words come easier to anyway. So I see why I might be alone in being like excited about an essay. Well, Claire, um, I, I, I get your point, but I have found when I have uh, had essays or like the, uh, the project that you turned in today, that the students that fall in the category of English as a second language write beautifully. Um, and, and as an aside, their penmanship <laughs> is beautiful too. <laughs> people who are, for people whose first language is not English. Oftentimes, like, I think the words, at least like in, so this is like off topic, but like in songwriting, like it's usually so much more creative because they use like not like words that you wouldn't normally use. So it actually like sounds like better or more interesting because like I just reuse the same like 45 words that I know. So I'm not arguing with you or like I'm not like discounting anyone's abilities. I'm just saying like I could see why some people would be like, I don't want to have to do this. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I think I do. Uh, Sorry, I'm like, I just finished the PowerPoint. So I feel like I'm on such like a buzz of like 
doing stuff. So I'm actually going to mute myself so I don't keep talking. But yeah, I just got a lot of ideas right now because I just was like, <laughs> Okay. It takes me like 15 minutes to write a posting for Instagram. So I can only imagine how long it will take me to write an essay. So <laughs> I'm afraid that I will spend all my time doing that and I miss the questions. <laughs> okay, Karina. Okay. Let's 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 say that it's all gonna it's gonna be multiple choice, no essay. Okay. Professor, quick question though. You know, uh, this should be more related to risk. So uh, in a way, maybe uh, more straightforward to kind of you know answer the more uh, perhaps a little bit of technical side too. I I didn't get you. If it's a multiple choice, is it like maybe a uh, one is small or one question kind of, you know, to explain a topic such as from the risk perspective. Oh, you mean if it's an essay? Yeah. I'm still not. It's a more practical in a way, I think. Essay, then would it be like on the risk of it? So you just write, you know. But the problem that I don't like about multiple choice questions is whenever I take one of those, I see like two answers that seem fine to me. Yeah. Right? And it's, it's easier for me just to write it down. Um, but you just did a massive project where you, where you wrote stuff down. So let's all agree that the final will be multiple choice. Okay. Right. Do I get a thumbs up? Awesome. Okay. Professor, quick question. Uh, where would the quiz grade be? Where would it be? Yeah, where, were you, or where are you going to put it on Blackboard or are you going to email it to us? Yeah, I'm going to put it on Blackboard. I, I didn't send them out before you finished your project because I didn't want to derail you. But, <laughs> but, but for most people, they would have been psyched because they got 100%. But and I still think uh, I don't want to stack up the uh, deliverables and stuff that I'm returning to you. So uh, anyway, great job, everybody. I was really pleased. Another question. When will we see our grade for the presentation? Well, I haven't looked at any of them yet, so I can't tell. No, I just was wondering. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You know, there are 50 people in the class. I, I, it, I'll, no rush, no rush. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll go through them, but to really give everybody the high grade they deserve, I like to read almost every word. If, okay. if, I, if I'm rushed, then I'm just looking for a few points that they get these in. Okay, they got them in, you get an A. I don't see one, you get an F. You know, it's better if I can just read the whole thing. Okay, so I no, don't know. No, no rush. I'll do it, I'll do it. Quick. I'll do it quickly. I haven't looked at any of them, but every other semester I've received something. They've been very good, very comprehensive, deep, and sometimes entertaining. <laughs> Hi, Professor. Hello. It's Janelle. Hi, Janelle. I just wanted to point out that my camera is on. <laughs> <laughs> is mine? I can see you. Okay. Okay. Today it's a little more technical than our other uh, topics, which have been a little lighter and a little more fun, admittedly. Uh, we're going to go through a lot of scenario analysis today. And the point of the analysis is to estimate how high losses could be if there was a bad scenario. For example, you know, what if interest rates were high? What if they were low? What if there was high unemployment? What if there was low unemployment? What if there was a pandemic? Uh, the last one usually doesn't make it into anybody's analysis, but that's what today's class is about. We'll be going through some of the ways that uh, banks are assessed in terms of their risk. Okay. Uh, you know, we just went through this slide. slide. 
I'll let you go through that on your own. Okay, scenario analysis. It evaluates the exposure to high severity events. So not just little events, big high severity events. And it doesn't mean like the events are likely to happen soon. It's just a high scenario, uh, a high risk scenario. For example, when I was in the mortgage business, our stress test, and I ran the stress test, also included earthquakes. And you know the type of earthquake, an 8.0 earthquake that would knock down all of the homes that we had mortgages on. So the bank would be in bad shape. So even though it wasn't likely that we would have an 8.0 on the Richter scale earthquake, it's something that we evaluated in terms of what the impact of the business would be in terms of applications, uh, number of people we needed processing the applications, number of people we needed in the collections area, all sorts of things. Um, a robust scenario analysis includes good quality background pr uh, preparation. And the scenario analysis is usually driven by somebody in the operations department or the credit policy department. And even though that's a front end department, they are, are well equipped to go through, at least identify a lot of what the scenarios are. Um, so I was, I was running a stress test that included operations losses, even though I was in credit policy. And the other reason I did it is that we were also looking at credit risks at the same time as operations risks. And we were looking at marketing risks at the same time. So all of that fell on me and my team. The important thing, number one, is good quality back background pr preparation. You know, if you know a certain part of the mortgage business, but you're going to look at the other part of it, another part of the mortgage business, you have to have it down cold. You really need to understand it in order to do a scenario analysis, or at least understand it pretty well, almost as much as the people that are on the floor. That'll help you uh, get some ideas about what could go wrong and what you have to prepare for and potentially uh, quantify what the risk is. Qualified and experienced facilitators. Well, I thought of myself as experienced. I don't know how qualified. Three, the appropriate quorum of participants, not too few, but also not too many. You need the key people there. A lot of people like to hear the sound of their own voice and you'll never get through the meeting. So you just get the key people and nobody else. A structured process for selecting data, selection of data. Now an example of that would be, I want five years of operation losses, uh, a historic uh, uh, data series of five years. And I want that for every operation in the business, whether it's application processing, whether it's collections, whether it's the marketing people, I'm gonna to go to everybody and ask for five years worth of data. That way I'm not doing a stress test on one part of the business with two years of data and another part of the business with five years of data, it takes forever to explain the differences in a variance analysis. So just get the right data consistent between the areas of the business. Next is high quality documentation. Um, you know, that's coming from the uh, stress test people. Um, an example would be uh, the documentation, for example, of higher interest rates and, and interest, interest rates are ticking up today. There would be a section in the stress test where you talk about higher interest rates means probably less business for the mortgage business because people aren't uh, refinancing a lot of mortgages. So higher interest rates cuts off that business, but where you need people are collections. Higher rates for adjustable mortgage loans means that there's gonna be higher delinquencies and higher credit losses. So all this has to be put and summarized into a stress test so people can understand 
what the numbers mean. Uh, a robust independent challenge process. Well, that's not hard to find, especially if you've got something negative to say about any part of the business, you'll get a robust, very robust independent challenge process. A process that is responsive to change. Say, we'll use the mortgage business as an example again. Um, all of a sudden they do start asking for co uh, co-signers. Um, so then you have to change your stress test to determine what kind of extra losses or what kind of, actually what kind of loss mitigation is possible if you're asking for a, a co-signer and bias minimization. You know, I don't, I don't want to go in there telling uh, the mortgage business that interest rates are going to go up. So people are going to stop refinancing. So I'm just going to look at the collections area. I like to walk in pretending and it wasn't that much of a stress stretch that I didn't know that much. I had done some background pre preparation, but not really enough to be biased on what the scenarios were and what the outcome would be. Okay. The point of doing the scenario analysis is actually there's, there's more than one point. It can identify a major risk in the business that people need to hop on. Okay, that's the obvious one. The second one, now at this point, you might wanna put on a pot of coffee because this gets a little detailed. The second one is these stress tests um, determine how much capital you need in the company or you need in the bank, how much capital you have as a cushion for risk for operations losses or any other kind of loss. So why, why don't you take a minute and read this? A quick question in the meantime, Professor. Uh, while you know, for, for financial institutions, there is a regulatory um, minimum capital requirement. Um, how would you kind of put that into perspective for corporates, whether it's private or public? Public, although they may have a little bit more, uh, you know, provision uh, provisions set aside. But when you talk about corporates. Are you talking like corporate loans for a bank? No, I'm talking about that, you know, the more or less how we can uh, kind of convey for corporates, I suppose, for, for banks or financial institutions. You know, I'm not getting you. Let's, let's get back at the end of this uh, discussion, okay? I want to move on. Is that okay. a my volume, perhaps? What's that? Is that a my volume, or can you hear me, Professor? I, I can hear you. I can, I can hear you. I'm not sure I understand the question. So let's hold off. Basically, I was just asking, you know, what's the difference between corporate and a financial institution when it comes to, uh, to putting a provision or reserves? What's corporate? That's the problem that I'm having. Or corporation or company or non-regulated company. So you're talking about a company besides banks? Correct. Okay. We'll get to that. We'll answer your question. Okay. Thank you. Um, total assets and likely returns on profits. Okay, when a bank makes a mortgage loan, uh, they're expect, and I'm making up these numbers to a degree, um, they expect something like a 5% return on consumer mortgages, but an 8% return on office buildings. And because the reason for that is that they price the interest rate higher normally for office buildings, okay? Because they're a little more risky. Um, but then you need to have capital and we're still gonna get into this. So if you're still a little fuzzy on this, don't worry about it. You need to put aside capital, the bank does, so it's not a risky asset. They can put aside $100 million, say, in capital, 
that they can use to cover their losses if the residential consumer mortgages go down, if their value goes down, or the office buildings, if the value goes down, you need some cushion so that their bank doesn't become insolvent, okay? If the assets of the bank go down and they're less than the bank's liabilities, then the bank is insolvent. The liabilities are greater than the assets, okay? So you need this, this regulatory cash to, um, to shore up um, your losses. Let's do it this way. Let's do a, uh, a case study. Okay, so a Zicklin student opens a bank. The uh, objective from the student is to lend $100 as mortgage loans. Okay, now when I go through something, I like to do the who, what, when, where, and why. The who that wants to open the bank is a Zicklin student. What, open a bank, when now, where in New York City, why desires to lend money and earn interest. Now we're gonna get into the how, okay? The Zicklin student doesn't have enough funds to lend $100 to somebody. The Zicklin student doesn't have $100, okay? That's no knock against Zicklin students. It could have been any school. Okay, so the solution is to open the bank, but get the funds from depositors who open the savings accounts, okay? They're gonna put money in your bank for savings and checking accounts. You take that money and you turn around and make mortgage loans with it, okay? Uh, so if all of a sudden your mortgage loan value of your mortgages drops below the value of your deposit funds, then you've got a problem. You don't have assets enough to pay back your depositors and there would be a run on the bank. So let's look at a couple of T accounts, okay? Here we start out, uh, we, we did a $100 worth of mortgages, 60 for consumer and four for office buildings, okay? So how did we fund that? We go to the other side. You know what, maybe I'll, can I use this thing? Does that show up any better? Or you can just follow my, my mouse. All right, let me try this. Okay. So, Zicklin student has lent this money out to whoever, but Zicklin student needed to get the cash. So he opened up the bank and people opened up checking accounts. Nobody, the Zicklin student, didn't inject any of his or her, her own capital. They got all the money to make loans from the deposits, from the checking accounts. Sounds good, right? No capital, 0% of assets. Uh, you know what? I forgot to go off this thing. Yeah. Won't let me go to the next page. I don't know if I do this. Okay. Okay, yikes. And I think that, believe it or not, might be a Yiddish word, yikes. Some mortgage customers are not paying back their mortgages. Consequently, their mortgage assets are worth less, okay? So you have residential office buildings are now worth 50, where they used to be worth 60, okay? Because some people aren't paying you back. Now, the business office buildings are okay, but now you see that you only have $90 worth of assets, okay? The problem is you owe people $100, okay? So right now, when you lost that $10 of your residential building, it was a $10 loss on the, on the, on the $10 loss, 
So now luckily your debits equal your credits, but only because you're showing a $10 loss, okay? So what we decide to do is inject some capital like we were just talking about. Zicklin student's mom gives him an additional $10 to put into the bank. Like she's the stockholder now, okay? She's not depositing money, she's giving money as a stockholder. So that goes as a liability. And the, the asset there is the additional capital. Okay, so now, now you're back up to 100. And you have, because you have this additional capital, because somebody gave you money as a cushion against losses. Okay, now you can still pay back the $100 that you need to for the savings accounts because you can use the office buildings, the, the residential, the office buildings and the capital, get you back up to a hundred that'll let you um, pay off your liabilities. Is that clear or is that clear as mud? Do you get that? The capital is used as a cushion, okay? And what we were saying before is that we run these scenarios so we can determine how much cushion we need, get it? If we run scenarios that show all sorts of losses, whether they be the assets declining in value or whether they be huge expenses from operations losses, you may not have enough money anymore as a bank to pay off your depositors who gave you all the money. So that's when you get a run on the bank. There's lines all the way uh, around the blocks for people to get their money out of the bank before there's no, no money left, okay? So once again, you do the scenario, you do the stress test. I would do the mortgage stress test. And at the end, I would come back to the head of the mortgage business and say, you need a billion dollars in capital. And here's why. Here, is the, here are the possible risks. Here's how bad the risk could be. And here is the likelihood that it's gonna happen. So this is what it's gonna cost us on an expected value basis. Remember, everybody remember expected values? You know, something could be a $10 loss, but if you only expect it to happen 10% of the time, then it's a $1 loss. That's the expected value. Capiche? Okay. Okay. Now, the regulators want even more capital. Okay, you have Zicklin's mom, Zicklin student's mom who put in the additional $10 of capital, but the bank regulators say, that's not enough. We want cushion. We want cushion in case the consumer residential and the business office buildings go down. So in addition to the $10 of capital you have, we, the regulators, want you to have another $25 of capital. And that capital is cushion. And we know that we developed a capital number because we do the stress test. Now, what's wrong with capital? Why, what's wrong with this $25 of capital on the balance sheet? It's not making any money. Exactly. It's barely making any money. Um, I don't have that slide there. But yeah, I mean, we, I thought, oh, we think we showed that slide. On a mortgage, we would expect to earn 5%. On the office buildings, 8%, but on the regulatory cash, maybe 1%, because you get to throw it into some kind of account, but it has to be one that's very safe and very liquid. So- Are, the, that, are those called these restricted accounts? Uh, I don't know. No? Okay. I, don't, I don't think it would be. I think that's something else. Um, lost my place here for a second. So we've got the additional capital. Okay, 
Now we get into something kind of sophisticated when we're evaluating the risk that the banks have, okay? The regulators and the stress test people, they don't treat all of the assets the same. In other words, you might need more cushion for one part of the business than the other part of the business. So they assign a risk weighting to the assets. So let's say consumer residential is a 50% risk rate rating, sorry about that. But business office buildings are carried at 100% of their asset value because they're riskier, okay? Um, additional capital is not risky. So it's, it gets a 0% risk. Additional regulatory capital is not risky. It's the consumer residential loan that's considered risky that you have to put capital up against and the business office buildings that are considered even more risky that you have to put up capital against. Okay, so when I do that, there was, remember there was $60 on the balance sheet for the consumer residential mortgages. If it gets a risk weighting of, of only 50%, then there's $30 worth of risk assets, okay? There's $60 worth of assets for the mortgage, but in determining the amount of capital we need, we cut that in half because it's not a very risky loan. Most people pay back their mortgage. Now, like, depending on the kind of mortgage, but you can expect 98% of the people to pay back their mortgage on a regular consumer mortgage. Okay, the office building is a little more risky. So that asset gets a, uh, a risk weight of 100%. So we carried it on the balance sheet at, four, at $40 and it's still $40. So to go back here a little bit, we had $60 for the consumer residential, which we cut in half as far as a risk asset, just for the purposes of determining capital. And we use the full $40 as the risk asset for determining capital for business office buildings. Okay. So now, you have the risk asset weighting, for example, $60 times 50%. But then let's say the regulators want 15% of the assets as cushion in an account somewhere. So the um, assets could decrease, decrease by 15%, you'd still be able to cover it. Okay, and the depositors would still be able to get their money back because you're putting up some cushion that doesn't earn you a lot of money, but it protects you against losses. So for the consumer residential, it got the same 15% capital requirement that the office buildings get, but the residential building has a lower risk asset number because it's considered less risky. Does that make sense to everybody? So when you, when you total up the amount of risk assets capital that you need, it's $10.5 here. And so the capital before the risk weighting, we saw that over there, $25. Additional capital needed, nothing. So now we have $25 of additional capital to offset the losses. And the question is, is $25 sufficient to cover the hypothetical loss scenarios? So that's when things get a little subjective again. First off, there's a conversation because you really, as we discussed before, you want to minimize your capital. You can't lend it. You can't make any real money off it. It's just a, a cushion. So that's why they want to minimize capital, the banks, those greedy banks. 
They want to be able to take the depositor's money and lend it all out. Okay. But if you, if you have a robust stress test process and assign pretty high probabilities that something is going to happen and, and give it a pretty high expense if it does happen, then that works out to be a lot of capital that you need against that part of the business. So the business people are always arguing that an asset is not risky so that it gets a, a low risk asset weighting. The regulators come back and say, I don't know what you're talking about. That's a very risky asset. So we want you to put 100% on the risk weighting. You do that, you do the capital requirements, and basically what you try to figure out is, is your $25 of additional capital enough to absorb any of the problems with your having with your assets, your ops loss expenses, anything like that. And a big part of this is running the ops loss scenarios. What happens if all of a sudden we have higher interest rates and our customers aren't paying us back? So we have to hire a bunch of collections people to call them up and try to get the money, okay? That's, that's a big expense that we have to plan for, higher interest rates, even though the interest rates have stayed remarkably low for the past two or, well, certainly since, since COVID-19 hit. Interest rates have been very, very low. But there is a scenario that you have to plan for where interest rates get very, very high. You do that analysis in conjunction with analysis on something else that could go wrong, you add them all up, and that gives you the amount of capital that you need, that $25 as a cushion, okay? Now, let's go back to the question about non-financial services and what they need for capital. That's not regulated nearly as much. You know, you're, you're gonna find that a major regulator for companies that aren't banks are the stockholders. They're the ones that'll buy and sell the stock depending on what they see. Whether they see if the capital level of a company is um, sufficient or not. Um, so that's the answer to the question is, is that banks still, or that non-banking entities still want capital, but this stress test process is a lot less robust. Uh, and like I said, it's really the stockholders are, that are voting on that. Does this bank have liabilities to assets that are too high, meaning their capital is too low? Did that answer the question? Okay, I'll assume it is. I couldn't get into the answer before because we needed to go Professor, through- um... You know, the asset quality is highly subjective. And uh, uh, how can you really measure, you know, what's in it? You know, how does the regulator or the, even the finance department now, you know, what's what's really, you know, going to happen in the present and short to medium term of the asset quality? How would you, uh, what suggestions do you have? I don't have much of, much of a suggestion. It's just, it's, I think it's highly subjective. I think it's just, um, it could happen um, at any given time. And at that time of the auditing of the of, of asset quality, it might still be okay. But the next time within three months time. But wouldn't you change. use a lot of historical data? I'm sorry? Wouldn't you be using a lot of historical data? Yeah, absolutely. So when you say it's highly subjective, did you mean that? I mean that talking about you know that uh, the existing um, assets, of course, the portfolio. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's uh, is there any is there any other way that that can be measured uh, more appropriately? 
Oh, wow. Wow. How, how would you do it? We have, we have historical data and then you have the likelihood of events happening and even that would have to be historical data. I, I don't see where it's as subjective as you think it is. I mean, if it's gonna be that subjective, don't do the stress test and just make up a number. No, all uh, what I'm saying is a professor, it's, you know, how would you now, let's say you are a bank and you are, you know, you have a portfolio of uh, a wholesale credit of a hundred million dollars to a counterparty. How do you know that's gonna actually pan out? Well, I think that's what maturity. we're talking about here, isn't it? I'm sorry? I'm just trying to understand your question. Isn't that what we're talking about here when you say whether that will pan out? We're developing a, a number for risk capital that we hope will be a cushion using the best data we have and the best assumptions we have. That's the best we can do to see whether it's gonna pan out. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I guess I'm also adding additional comment to it. Uh, you know, what I've seen is that the asset quality, you know, changes, you know, very rapidly. And, um, even though you would have, you know, the best stress testing scenarios, you know, it's just that uh, it may not be always there. Well, typically if, if an area is riskier than another area, the stress test happens more frequently. You don't have to think that it happens once a year. It doesn't mean that your operations are blowing up and your assets are deteriorating in quality, but you wait until December 31st to do your next stress test. So I think what we've learned here is that we use historical data. We have to use our best estimates for what's gonna happen going forward. And a lot of that is historical data. And um, the, the frequency for which you do the stress tests is a lot determined by how risky the asset is. So that's, it's a pretty good system. It's rigorous, rigorous, robust, um, and not highly select, uh, subjective. Why don't Professor, we take a may break? I ask a question? Sure. Why don't, well, okay, go ahead. And then we'll take a break. I, I just would, would like to ask if there's something else as a source of uh, data that we can use, since you have told us once that historical data can not always be reliable. Yeah. Um, data isn't always reliable, Alessandra. Um, that could be a problem. You know, if, if you have bad input and you go through the throughput, your output's not going to be right. It's like, gar the, the expression for that is garbage in, garbage out. So you have to minimize the garbage in and just use the best systems you can come up with to track data. But it happens. Sometimes even the, the historical data could be fudged to make it look like a potential risk is very remote. But that's why you have auditors, the third line of defense. Okay, let's take a, uh, let's take a 10 minute break here. Come back at 7.15.
Okay. This is pretty much where we left off. We had the additional $25 of capital as cushion. Is the $25 sufficient to cover hypothetical loss scenarios? Okay. When I would do the stress tests, I would come up with a number and say, this is what I think we need. And the regulators would look at it. And they would come back and they would say, okay, you're sufficiently capitalized. But they never gave me a number for what they would have had for capitalization. Just that, okay, you're adequately capitalized. So a lot of it is just the check of the regulators to see if the $25 is sufficient. Funny story. I had a regulator come back to me and said, you have more capital than you need. And his point was, if you have less capital, you'll be able to lend more. You'll make more money. That'll cause the bank to be stronger. And it helps the safety of the banking system. And I thought, well, of course, that's why, we don't, <laughs> that's why we don't want all this capital. But I thought it was a pretty enlightened regulator who came back to us and said, you know, I think that you're over reserved here. You have too much capital. So it can happen. Uh, now let's go back to Wells Fargo for a second and look at their expenses. Now, here's a time series of Wells Fargo expenses for a total of, in 2018, 56 billion, okay? And as you can see, most of the line items here have pretty consistent expenses between the years. You see that salaries, which is the main expense, goes up a little in 2017, a little in 2018, not materially. What is like one over 16, what is that, 6%, something like that? Um, incentives about the same, employee benefits, they even went down a little bit. What do we see that sort of doesn't fit that pattern? Anybody? Are, are you saying what's the one that kind of standing out? Yes. I mean, well, you did the mark one, which is operating losses. Um, <laughs> uh, and that, that's that's kind of like- that, You think that's a giveaway? Um, it is, it is. Uh, yeah. I, I, want, I wanted to point out a couple things to you here that you know it's a pretty material number, right? It's, it's not the highest number, but it's not the lowest number either. It's a pretty material number, okay? The second thing is that if you look at the time series and the patterns mm -hmm. from a million six to 5.5 .5 to 3.1, mm -hmm. what, what insight does that give you? That, that's a quite a jump, like a big event. I don't know. Oh, that's when... Um... No, this is 2016, December. Well, don't worry about the year. Don't worry about okay. the year. A lot of it happened in, in 2015. It was too early, early for them to even deal but with. That, that's, when it, that's when it actually hit to pay the, the whole legal expenses. Where they really hit was when they were mopping it up in 2017. So that's when they kind of recognized them. The yeah, that's when they... Months bit the bullet and took the expenses related to it. So there's a lot of variance in there. A little bit of line item right below of operating losses, contract services, it's not significant, but kind of uh, inching up a little bit. Yep. Wow. 
Yep. For a thousand. From 1.6 to 2.1, is that when they actually got the legal fees? Now they have to start doing some work to fix all that. Something. <laughs> Another year. <laughs> now, a question after seeing the numbers bounce around like this. And, and that goes back to the conversation that we were having before we broke up for uh, the break. What challenges do you see doing scenarios for operating losses? You don't know when to expect it. Like you don't know when one is gonna blow up. If you're doing like, well, if you're first trying to forecast, which is not a thing, but. Well, here I would take some historical data if I was doing the stress test and I would find out about why there was the increase then what happened in 2018. And I think if we, if we looked at 2019 and 2020, we'd see some pretty big numbers there. I haven't looked, but they might even be bigger than the 3.1. So, uh, your stress test leader here is looking at these numbers and trying to assess how we can do stress tests on it, looking partially at historical data. So what, what do you do? Uh, let me find somebody. Sebastian, you there? Okay. How, how would you handle this if you, any ideas on how you would handle it if you were modeling it, the operating losses? Because there is such variation between the years. Um, I mean, it kind of makes it hard to handle, like uh, someone else said, it's like, you can't expect it, the operating losses. Um, I mean, how would you model it? Okay, what, what I would do is I would look at the historical data and then I would massage it. That's the term for it. I would be looking for outliers. And um, I'd be asking the team, why is it 5.5 million in 2017? And is this likely to be a number that we'll see again? Why or why not? Okay. Should I assume that ops losses are going to be a million six or a billion six when uh, things get back to normal? Or should I assume that ops losses will be 3.1 when things get back to normal or 2.1 or 5.1? The answer is, is, is it when when is it that because the the well I, I don't know if it goes so it's going through the legal and those things don't close right away so you still have to see until the day they close because the expenses might still be occurring. Yeah, it's, it's not a thing. It's not really the timing as much. I know what you're talking about. But oh, it's, I, okay, okay. It's not so much the timing of entries; it's the amount of the entry. I think they had huge legal expenses in 2017. And, and that would be the kind of thing that, and you know, it, it's paying the lawyers and it's also restitution to the customers. Right, so I'm, I'm kind of- So I would look at the 5.5 billion in 2017 and I'd be asking the operations folks, am I gonna see that number again? What drove that number? Really, what drove that number? And then let's decide how likely it is that we'll see something like that again or that we're gonna see something more even, okay? So not only does this have the um, uh, advantage for us that we can help, that it will help us calculate and estimate what our ops losses are and what our, cal uh, what our cap capital needs to be. I guess the way to put that is not only does it determine how much our capital needs to be, but it also makes people look at their process. You've got somebody that racked up 5.5 billion in 2017. So they'll come to you and say, you'll never see 5.5 billion again. 
because these are the changes that we've made to the process, okay? The changes are we're no longer having people open phantom accounts. We're gonna be following them, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't expect this, uh, another catastrophic explosion like that. So it's unlikely we'll ever see the 5.5 again. So do I just throw out the data and call that an outlier? Probably, probably not. Probably we're gonna have a, a more conservative, meaning a higher number for what their legal expenses could be. Because Wells Fargo has a relatively low control environment. And it's still to this day is low relative to a lot of the big money center banks. You mean high risk? Higher risk. Okay. So there is some massaging of the data that you have to do in order to calculate how much capital is reasonable. But at the same time, it gets people to look at their organization and say, I don't want that to ever happen again. And so they make changes as a result. Okay. I'll give you a couple of mi minutes to read this. This is also from Wells Fargo. Professor, could you zoom in a little bit? Probably, but I don't know how to do it. I can do it for the PowerPoint, but it's not working here. So you can't read it? Does anybody know how I can do it? Oh, wait a second. <laughs> Does that help any? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, you don't have to look at the numbers at the end. But what they're talking about is exactly what we've been talking about. And this, this comes from their annual report. And it's a very important part of the annual report. Do the regulators believe that they have adequate capital as a cushion? And this is what you'll kind of see in the annual report. It'll talk about their risk-weighted assets. Remember, they took some assets, we took some assets like the mortgage business, and we said on a risk-weighted asset perspective, from that perspective, consumer mortgage loans are less risky than business loans. So we gave a lower risk asset weighting to mortgage loans, to consumer mortgage loans. When you do all that for all of your assets, you get a total of risk-weighted assets. Okay, so here we have another billion. Uh, that doesn't seem right. Okay, well, we'll call it that a billion for now. Yeah, okay. And then the amount of capital that we've decked against it. So in December 31st, 2018, using the advanced uh, approach for measuring um, capital requirements. They had a 16.8% capital ratio and a 16.5% capital ratio um, based on those two different methods. So now let's, well, we'll get into the two methods in a second. But now we go through some regulatory stuff. What is Basel? Well, Around the year 2000, maybe 2001, um, the idea that the banks were all interdependent got a lot of publicity because there were things happening. There was the, uh, the economy in Asia sank for a while and they were calling it the Asian contagion because it was affecting other banks, banks who had lent money to 
uh, even sometimes banks lend money to each other, right? And so the Basel committee and meetings were designed to set up certain standards that could be used to make sure that everybody was well capitalized, not just, uh, not just a few banks, but they were all capitalized in every country. Um, like we said, this makes rec uh, recommendations on regulations, risk, that kind of thing. So these are the company, the countries that got together. Anyone's, uh, any countries jump out at you as being missing? Oh, Greece, no. <laughs> yeah. Greece had the, <laughs> the kind of, <laughs> all the shakes. <laughs> um, one starts with C and one starts with R. China. Canada. <laughs> oh no, Canada is here. China, China and Russia didn't participate. Do they have their own thing? I don't know what they have. I don't know if anybody knows. Okay. The, the Communist Party may know. So Basel I was not that sophisticated. They didn't have any risk weighting of the, of the loans. Uh, there was no good model for default correlation between the other risks the firm would see. So uh, sometimes the risks are double counted uh, if, if you don't look at the correlation between the risks. And operations risk wasn't even emphasized. It was more like what would happen to their loan portfolio. Okay, uh, in 2004, they wanted to be more forward looking. Um, it, it's, a, it's a much, much better system. Um, and that's where they, they spelled out there should be a process for doing stress tests. That, uh, regulators, I misspelled that, regulators should have access to the stress test and determine whether it's adequate. They should be able to force banks to have a certain amount of capital. And they the regulators can come in if they think that for whatever reason, the, regu the required amount of capital is not as high as it should be. So Basel II really gives the regulators a lot of power. Basel I was more like, hey, you know, let's be a little more cognizant of our risks because it could take down the whole banking system. Basel II is, we don't trust you to be evaluating your risks. So we're gonna have these regulators do it. Now this is dragging out for years. Basel III is still <laughs> a work in progress. They think that they've had, they have it done and then other things uh, come up, but, but mostly Basel III is making a more rigorous uh, quantitative tests for the amount of capital that's needed. And we talked about some of these is the relevant historical period used. You know, do you wanna go back five years if the fourth and fifth year were completely different than what you're doing now? Uh, will the future be accurately predicted by the historical data? Do you know what the uh, odds of something like this happening are? Uh, focusing on two narrow measures, for example, just like loan delinquencies, instead of loan delinquencies and losses and customer fallout, um, overlooking knowable risks sometimes happens just because they're obvious. 
and you miss some new risks. It's a common mistake by the risk managers is they get the book that somebody used the year before for the stress test and does the exact same thing. <clears throat> okay, now we saw up here for Wells Fargo, an advanced approach and a standardized approach. We'll call the standardized approach sort of the basic, it's pretty close to it. Okay, when banks first started doing stress tests, they did it as a function of revenue. If your historical revenue was high, then you had a big risk of losses. If your historical revenue was low, based on historical data, then this approach said that you're not gonna need a lot of capital in the future. Um, the last bullet point pretty sums up what sums up what the flaw of this is that they will enjoy much lower capital risk requirements in years when the bank is producing lower revenue even if things have not changed at all so intuitively to calculate the amount of cushion you need based on revenue is not all that crazy it's just that it can be a lot better. Let me find out where I was here. It could be a lot more robust. I lost my page. Now we have the advanced measurement approach. Uh, Before when I've done this class, we've gone through the formula and, and, and actually generated some numbers. And it took a whole class, so I'm not gonna do that this, this semester. But just know that it has a much, much better, higher confidence level and uses much more data, internal loss data, external loss data, scenario analysis. It's just way, way more robust. Have you ever heard of Monte Carlo simulator, simulations? There may be some of you here that are uh, statistics majors. Uh, I know about this. I had people that would do this, but it generates an expected probability of something based on looking at multiple, multiple scenarios running scenario after scenario after scenario until you get to something that you think is that 99.9% .9 certainty. That seems like a stretch to me, but what it's really um, um, focused on is the probability that something is gonna happen. Okay, and that comes through these these, this analysis of frequencies. How could this happen? How often could this happen? And then the second part is the severity of the event. If it ever did happen, how much would it cost? So you multiply the frequency and the severity and you get the expected losses from that kind of event. And then you determine how much capital cushion you need for those expected losses. And here we see something highly subjective. And that's because people can just give you any kind of data. Okay, here are some of the potential issues. A judgmental bias, 
um, swayed by background data. Uh, availability bias means that you're focusing on the numbers that you have available, your historical uh, numbers, and you rely on those even if there's probably data out there that's much better. Uh, let's take a look at these. Sure. Now, it is possible to buy insurance against operation losses. There are insurance companies that will sell you a policy for just about anything. And banks can go and find an insurance company, Lloyd's of London or somebody that will insure, uh, insure them against operating losses. But the regulators don't give full credit for that. At best, they reduce the uh, capital by 20%, even if you think you're covered 100% by an insurance company. One of the reasons for that is the insurance company could go insolvent too. And you saw a lot of that in 2008. The insurance companies for different collateralized bonds just went completely insolvent. So the people they were insuring went insolvent too. So that's why the capital requirement gets a little 20% haircut, but it doesn't completely go away if there's insurance. Okay, this was from last year, but I still think the question is good. Who is the most likely to advocate for higher business regulations and risk control? Now, you don't have to betray your, your political leaders. Hmm? I would say Biden. Would be what? Um, would He would ask for more risk controls. Why, why, do, you say, why do you say that? Um, I mean, besides uh, Democrats having historically trying to put in more regulation, uh, especially financial sides, yeah. Uh, and I mean, he's been asking for it you know, ever since the, they did relax some of the regulation over the Trump period, so. Right. Yeah. Anybody else wanna make a comment? Well, that's right, that uh, democratic uh, administrations are more likely to have a, a higher level of control consistent with uh, Democrats are more likely to have a larger government and more government control than the Republicans. Now the Republicans will tell you, Trump, if he was you know, lucid that day, would tell you that uh, you need fewer bank regulations and less capital. And the logic behind that would be that enables the bank to make more money, which makes them more profitable, which is a positive for the safety and soundness of the banking system. So it's not crazy to say that we need less regulation. It's just you have to sort of buy the story that the additional profits will outweigh the additional risk. It, you know, it really never rose to the level of what you would hear about when these two candidates were going at it with each other. But they certainly had very, have very different philosophies. Uh, we went through this before. They don't, uh, Trump would not want capital because it reduces the amount of profits and returns they get from different assets. Capital only returns 1%. And this is from August 20th, 2019, when Trump was still president and critics warned that the banks were backsliding, that they weren't, um, it says that a series of regulatory changes that could chip away at new crop capital requirements for big banks. And that was under Republican administration.
yet overall capital ratios at big banks stood at about 14%. We saw that Wells Fargo had 16%. But you, as you can see from the slide, some banks were 26%. I don't know how they're making any money. Professor, you're not sharing the slides. I'm sorry about that. Another question, Professor, over here. Um, does MPLs drive higher capital requirements? LPLs? Non-performing loans. Yes, NPLs. Yes, um, non-performing loans, higher write-offs, more cushion needed. Does that make sense? That makes sense. And here's the slide about the back sliding that a lot of regulators felt was happening during the Trump administration. Yeah, I just, I threw this in because sometimes we lose sight of all this, the stakeholders that are in banks. But, you know, it includes the stockholders, the employees, the investors, and the customers. I should have put stockholders in there. Okay, now let's go, we've, we've touched on this, but we touched on the private loan that was an international loan. This is a, about a, um, a case that I had when I was in the student loan business that we saw a need there for students to get more cash than what they could get out of the federal student loan program to meet their need to go to school. Um, why would the bank do that? Uh, there's the obvious reasons, but you would start a new program because banks can't just show high earnings. They need to grow earnings. Any company that wants their stock price to go up has to be growing earnings. If not, the stock is worth what your earnings are now. But if you want to bump that up, you need to grow earnings so people start different product lines. And that was one of the reasons we started this, this product line to make some money and, uh, and to help the students out, but also the optics to show shareholders and prospective shareholders that we were doing things to grow earnings. So as you do things to grow earnings, and it's a new thing, there's all sorts of ways that there could be ops losses. Uh, and, and this is my list of things that really need to be done top of mind to build a business. The first thing you do is you defend the current base of customers that you have. You don't wanna lose the customers that you have. It's much, less expensive to retain a customer than to get a new one, okay? Then there are sales channels improvements. You improve on say your email advertising. Say sales channel expansion, you might go into telesales or direct mail. Customer universe expansion. That means that you're going to more people. You do your solicitations, not just to college students, but to college students and people that um, say have been out of college two or three years because they want to consolidate their loans. But what we're talking about here is product development. It's here to grow earnings and to grow the stock price. And, and this is done 
um, based on all the studies that they do and competitors offer just so they are outstanding? Is that like kind well, of partially to you know, maintain the current base in a way? But what about maintaining the current base? I, because they find a better product out there and they don't keep up with. Yeah, a lot, you know, a lot of times would be, let's, let's go back to Credit Protector. People were enrolled in Credit Protector and they were paying an extra six or 7% on their interest rate. And they paid for that on their balance month after month, month after month. Mm -hmm. So then you would have customers that would cancel the program because they didn't see any value in it and they were sick of paying for the fees, okay? But what you try to do first is retain those customers because at one point they did see value in the product. You just need to reinforce that value, which is a lot easier than coming up with a new product for a new customer and trying to, trying to persuade a new customer that there's some value there. So that's always the first on the pecking list and also, you know, we had 500,000 customers for, um, for Credit Protector. And there's no way we could do more than say 50,000 new customers a year if everything went right. So you really have to focus on who you have, but you need to have this product ideation going or you're never gonna grow. And, and now on that product development part, that's, that's what you mean, right? Say that again. On that product development part now, or was it yes. more? Yes, because that's where, you know, that's the pitfall and you can make mistakes. Mm. Okay. Remember, we talked about those employee failure, internal right. fraud and external fraud. Employee so, failure is a big one when you have a new product. Execution, right. delivery, and process management, they're big risks when you're rolling out a new process. Yeah. Um, we talked about continuity of business plans where our startup in, in uh, California had a backup uh, facility right next to a nuclear power plant in an earthquake zone, right? There's all these things and mistakes that people make. Some of them are obvious, some are whoppers that you can't imagine it, but it happens. And they happen more when you're starting out with a new product. So you have all sorts of things coming from out in left field, all sorts of risks that you didn't anticipate. Now, for something like credit risk on this, this uh, private loan, it was managed through the underwriting from the credit management subject matter experts, uh, you know, the credit policy people. Uh, credit risks were also managed by the pricing of the loan. You know, a more um, risky customer got a higher rate on, on their loan. Um, banking regulations um, don't permit you to base your, uh, your, your interest rate on um, the student's major. Like if you're majoring and you're getting your master's in business, it's really the same as if you're getting an art history degree in terms of you know, whether we were, would be able to discriminate you um, for interest rates. Every, every major within a college, within a college got the same interest rate. That's what the regulator said. But we could discriminate based on the, the school itself and what the losses were in the school. If a school had high losses, we could charge a higher interest rate. And the losses, the loss data there would be the data that we got through the federal student loan programs. And we could see you know, what kind of customers paid us back and what kind of customers didn't. And so um, we would be able to, from a school perspective, discriminate between the schools and charge different rates. Now, uh, I forget the numbers on Baruch. I'll, I'll go look them up. Maybe I can have them for the next class, but what, what, to, what, what college in the US do you think has the lowest default and write-off expenses? What school pays their loans back the most? 
MIT. What's, what was that? MIT. No, not MIT. There's two actually that really stand out. Is there a logic between that question or is it just a like random school? Is, is it what? Is there a logic to, to answer that? I think there's a logic. <laughs> just, I, I, yeah. think there, I think there's a logic, but it's not super intuitive. Is it the is it Harvard? Okay, so we're talking about two really good schools now. Public, are we talking Harvard and Columbia, Harvard and Yale? Harvard. You're, you're going to the Ivy League schools and you shouldn't be going there. That's UCLA. very expensive. <laughs> that? Those are Fordham, expensive. Fordham University. Fordham, why would Fordham pay him back? <laughs> I think a state school. A uh, UCLA. Are we taking? Okay, why UCLA? It's a school? it's a state school and highly reputable. And the tuition is low, so they don't have big loans. Are we talking about Baruch? Probably. <laughs> You're not, we're not talking about Baruch. I'll get the numbers on Baruch. If I have to go back to Citibank and see if I can get them. Okay, one of the schools that's really good for paying back loans is Notre Dame. Oh, I heard about that. And oh, the, okay. other, the other one is that's really good is Brigham Young University, BYU. Where is that? I've never Utah. heard of it. Oh, Brigham Young, it's a, it's a Mormon school where almost mm -hmm. everybody is Mormon. And they're all like second or third generation BYU students. So oh. there's a feeling that you don't want to, um, do anything to put a blemish on DYU. Is it because of the religious aspect? <laughs> it's a for real, it's a I'm, real. Not, I'm not getting into that. <laughs> that, that I can't step in that. Uh, it, I, schools notably that are very religious. I, I think like Notre Dame, you have to take like religious courses and all that. Yeah. So, I mean, there might be a correlation there. I think there's, there's a correlation, but what you would ask is if it's causation, um, well, the, I was going to say something else, but I'll leave it because I don't know how that's, I still don't know how that's related to anything. Uh, does it just happen that they pay? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It seems, it seems counterintuitive to me. I would have gone after um, the good public universities. Um, well, I would have thought that they would be, you know, really the highest the uh, go to good schools, the uh, loan balance isn't as high. Oh, is it because we get good scholarships also? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I okay. can tell you that, let me ask you this. What school do you think is absolutely terrible that I did not want to make loans to? NYU. How'd you know that? Because uh, my sister went to NYU, but she went for nursing. No, no, no. She's fine because she went for nursing and she was like an RA, except like her friends did like art history and they're like really depressed because they owe like $200,000 and they have a degree in art history. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I heard that. <laughs> you hear a lot of stuff, don't you? I know. Yeah. You, you're like, well, you're in the because, know because for all the I... college tuition stuff. No, so the thing is NYU actually was on my list when I was trying to get my master's program. And then I hear the stories about the art people where they have a lot of loans. So I did not want to end up like one of them. <laughs> oh, oh, and as far as NYU goes, the worst place by far is the law school. By far. <laughs> I, I didn't want to make loans to anybody in, in NYU and I certainly didn't want to make loans. I didn't want to make loans to uh, anybody in the law school, but I was working with a bunch of those people. <laughs> so, law school is expensive. Said, I do well, think there's like, oh, sorry, go. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say like, there are, I think like maybe not law, but there are certain, like certain majors or professions where like, I think it's like really lucrative to like, maybe like the Stern did like, I don't know. There are some like parts of it where I think like everyone that I know that went there came from like a lot of money, but maybe they don't need loans in the first place. I don't know. I think it's like an interesting, I don't know. Never um, mind. <laughs> you know what I'm I, trying to say though? Yeah, I, I, I do. Yeah. At, at NYU, they take a, a very aggressive sort of anti-lender approach. When 
students get financial aid and they're finished with the four years or the two years that say they're in business school and it's time for them to graduate and pay back loans. The students go, I think they're required to go to a meeting at the financial aid office and the financial aid administrator tells everybody about basically how you can get out from paying the loan, how you, how you can get out under it and not have to pay it. And so there's all sorts of, you know, we had like the federal program, you could get a deferment and you wouldn't have to pay back the loan if you lost your job for a few months. That's, that's in the federal program. So, you know, we did all those things too. Um, but because the interest rate was higher than the federal loan program, we had more people default because they couldn't pay the higher interest rate. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, so we met, we tried to do the operations by leveraging as much as we could from the federal program. And we used all of the existing technology for the most part. So now you understand why I'm getting, I told you all this, why we're getting here, is that the risk capital for that loan was therefore based largely on the government student loan program. Not great, but there was no other data to work with. What Citibank had was years and years of data for hundreds of thousands of customers, but that was for the federally insured loan program. So we had to run all sorts of scenarios, but we didn't do that at first. We just said, okay, the, the amount, to, we're gonna give this a risk weighting of 80% and 50% capital, something like that. Well, loan delinquencies and losses were significantly higher than expected. Uh, credit policy under, underestimated the risks. Uh, there was a lot of external fraud. Uh, we didn't even validate that the student was enrolled in many cases. Uh, and uh, what is the last one? I don't know. I don't, I don't even know what this means. Let's get rid of it. Okay. Um, as a result, we increased the capital requirements. And um, therefore, the return on the investment, as we pointed out, was a lot less. Uh, and so if the return on the investment wasn't very good for the loan, then resources were allocated to different products, different loans. And so what brought this product down really was the amount of capital that was required because of the high losses and the high operations expenses. Okay. I don't really have much more to go through tonight. Are there questions there about out there about what you just turned in did everybody get theirs in um yeah i guess um i guess we just i mean myself i'm just wondering and so uh, just kind of like so we're having one more class and then we're having a an exam right that's right one more class and it's going to be about IT. Okay. And we have a guest lecturer. Oh. Okay. Nice. Who is that? For about the last 45 minutes. I think it's I think it's a Zicklin graduate uh, who volunteered to come and talk about IT and, and insurance that you could buy against IT disruptions. Oh yeah, is it uh that's not called cyber security, but it's some insurance. Um I think it's it's Partly cybersecurity. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. What about anybody and else? Um, Professor, I was thinking about 
you're telling how the banks cannot discriminate between majors. Um, I think recently they have started income share agreement. So Yale started giving on income share agreements and have started giving different <laughs> for different majors. And I think some fintech companies have copied that model and started it on. I think banks are investing in those fintech companies to get around it. Yeah, you guys, you, you would be good risks. I would easily write you guys for the student loans. No problem whatsoever. That's good. I can give your name to the people names to the people still there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You worked hard, you got your, uh, you got your uh, assignments in. So let me just start looking at your assignments and cut you loose for tonight. If I have any questions about your assignments, I'll, I'll email it if I didn't get it or if something looks funky. Thank okay? You. Thank you. Sounds okay. good. Next week. Professor. <laughs>